Y'all need to look at the clock out there in the foyer. <laughs> it's so good to be together that sometimes we lose track of time. You're still talking out there. <laughs> I know, it's hard. I mean, it... We are in stage three, whatever that means, I don't know. It could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, we do want to recognize a few realities that this coronavirus is still out there floating around and it does still affect certain people more readily and more severely than others. So I ask you, be sensitive to those folks that are around you. Make sure that you are aware of their perhaps level of vulnerability um, and we're all trying to get through this the best way that we can and so we just want to be kind and gentle and compassionate to those folks that uh, maybe need a little extra care physically. Um, that means translating that to you all. If you don't need to sit together, kind of spread out a little bit. We got some chairs over here, we got some chairs over here, I got a little space back there. It looks pretty good though. Your family units, obviously, you've already been in contact with each other, so you're free to, to sit together. But it is something we need to be a little bit careful for. We love each other, and we don't want to put anyone at any undue risk. So keep that up. You're doing a great job, and we'll, we'll move through this together. Um, this is a formal welcome to you all. It's good to be together today. Uh, a couple things as far as announcements go. I want you to be aware of kind of the direction that we're headed here. We are going to meet like this uh, at 11 o'clock, just for a kind of an abbreviated, um, I say abbreviated, Mark says I talk just as much as I normally do, so whatever you want to make of that. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but we'll be meeting like this, uh, this Sunday and then next Sunday, the 7th of uh, June. On the 14th, we are going to move to a more regular, what we're used to, uh, order of service. We're going to gather together for Sunday school. Um, we'll be combining the two adult classes, and I'm going to be teaching a single class to all the folks that want to come to this on the book of Job. Um, that one is a challenge to many of us. Job is full of uh, arguments and discussions, and it, really the whole book deals with this idea, and there's a theological term for it called theodicy. Theodicy basically means... Why do good things happen, or why do bad things happen to good people? And if God is good, then how does evil exist? And those are questions that are tough to answer. And so we're going to move through that together and chew on that together. And for those folks that have been in my Sunday school class and know that I have a tendency to go on and on and on, and I'll say, hey, we're going to be in this book until we're done with it, I will assure you at the end of August, we will be done with Job. I'm going to try to stay on schedule Stay the course. Yeah, you're all laughing about that. Sure he will. Yeah, that'll happen. But uh, we're going to try to work through that book of Job uh, through the summer, and we'll finish up at the end of August. And so we invite you, if you're uh, interested in that, to come to that. We'll be meeting in the fellowship hall together. And then hopefully by that time, we'll have kind of settled to a point where we can go back to what we've been doing a little more regularly. So that's coming up. Also want to let you know that on the 7th is coming Sunday, we're going to start a series on the book of Colossians. This is your call to read the book of Colossians. should not take you more than a few minutes. It is not a huge book. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that book. That's what we're going to be looking at. And again, through the summer season, we're going to be looking at that letter that Paul wrote to the church in Colossae and try to get some insight from that. So I encourage you to take a look at that. There are many other things going on in our lives, and we're trying to figure out how to be the people of God in this time. And so I encourage you to remember each other in prayer, uh, remember each other, uh, the folks that can't be with us, that are at home for whatever reason. We want to keep our hearts focused on them as well. So I invite you to bow with me as we ask a blessing on this service. Lord, we gather together in your name. We gather together to worship you, to encourage each other to learn from your word, and we ask that you'd be present in a way that is special to us today. Open our hearts to what it is that you have for us. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to take your hymnals. 
we have a gathering reading that I'd like to invite you to share in 662 in the back, a responsive reading. Again, we're getting some practice on these. These are self-explanatory. 662, the back of the hymnal. I call it the hymnal because that's what it says on the front. So, but it's the blue one is what we're looking at. Come, let us worship. Come, let us worship and bow down. Come, let us worship and bow down before the Lord, our Maker. comes from John's Gospel, the 14th chapter, if you'd like to turn to it and follow along. In this 14th chapter, John is recording the words of Jesus, the way Jesus was encouraging his own followers, which would include us, the, encouraging them as to what would come. This was before his crucifixion. Beginning in the 15th verse, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one that loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much more to you, for the Prince of the world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Amen. If you've been following the news recently, you know that our nation is in a certain level of turmoil for many reasons. There's a lot going on, and sometimes we wonder, Lord, what is it that we are supposed to do? How are we supposed to respond? What is it that, that you would have for us? And I think... More than anything else, God would have us draw near to him. Some of you have received emails from different organizations encouraging you to pray. It is a time of prayer in our nation, the prayer for the situation in many cities, the protests, the disruptions, the riots, whatever is happening in those places. It's a time of prayer for those that we've lost uh, over the course of the last few months as a nation and as a world. We've 
had much suffering and death in our, in our lives, and it's appropriate for us to pray in these times. And so I'd invite you, if you would, join me, and I'll read this prayer. Gracious God, you are the loving one who holds us in our pain and in our grief. Lord, it feels like our world is coming apart at the seams, and we are powerless to do anything. We are only dust. Your image on us and your breath of life in us doesn't seem to be enough to confront the systemic and the pervasive evil that surrounds us. We are weak vessels, cracked and fractured ourselves. How can we heal anything, Lord? And we mourn. We mourn the loss, the loss of life, the loss of connection and companionship, the loss of civility in our public life, the loss of peace and security and justice as violence clogs our streets and our cities. Lord, we need your Spirit anointing us, indwelling us, giving us both the wisdom and the strength to see and to do your will. In the face of diseases we have no way to combat, give us comfort and compassion for each other so that we might each feel secure. In the face of loneliness and isolation, help us to reach out in ways that we haven't considered to remind each other that your love knows no barriers. In the face of anger and animosity and the rage that points fingers and lays blame, give us your reconciling heart so that we may help each other see that each human being has been made in your image and is deeply loved by you. In the face of violence, help us to spread your peace, boldly proclaiming your steadfast loving kindness towards each of your warring children. Help us, Lord. Give us words that heal and keep us from giving in to the temptation to use our words to incite or to increase division, regardless of how righteous we believe our perspective to be. Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, we are reminded of how weak we are. We see the pain and the division and the lack of love in our world, and we feel powerless. Our hands are not strong for the task. It must have been like this for the disciples, too. So much evil to confront, so little capacity. But you came to them. The power of your Spirit was poured out on them, and they received that comforter, that advocate, your presence that Jesus promised. And they were strengthened, and they went forth. Lord, we claim that same promise the one that Jesus made, that you would not leave us alone, that we would not be orphans, that, you would that we would receive your Spirit. Pour it upon us, Lord, so that we may be your people and do your will, and so that throughout, uh, through us you might heal our communities, our families, our cities, our villages, the countryside, the fields and forests, the rivers and seas, the very air we breathe and the soil we stand on. Help us to dream your dreams and see the visions you've illuminated for us. Help us to reach beyond the violence and the division and the anger and the fear. Help us to reach beyond our reach. And in the strength of your spirit, take a hold of that blessed promise that things on earth would be as they are in heaven. We pray these things in the name of the one who makes all things possible your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. In spite of all the turmoil and stuff that goes, that's going on in our world today, we as Christians still have some answers. Amen. And the song that we're going to sing now 
speaks well to that. Uh, number 301 in the blue hymnal, and we'll sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5. And could we stand, please? story. I see we have some kids today. You're welcome to come up and get really close to each other. No, don't do that. How are you doing? Who's on your shirt? You're not going to tell me who that's Elsa? No. Do any of you older kids want to come up here too? <laughs> okay, that was priceless. They just all ducked duck down. All right. Well, tell you what, this is good for everybody. So everybody gets to hear this. What do you think I've got right here? What's that look like? A rock. You want to try to hold it? There you go. Does it feel smooth or rough? What do you think? Smooth or rough? Pretty rough, right? Oh my goodness. Is it smooth or rough? It's pretty rough. It is rough. Here, let me see that. Let's see if Patrick, you want to feel it, Patrick? Okay, you're going to sit down. Here, feel this rock. Feel it. Scratchy, scratchy. Yeah. So, you see all those little bitty grains in there? Like this rock is made up of a whole bunch of little tiny, tiny, tiny rocks all squeezed together, right? You see that? Well, those little round bits of things in there, it's not sand, it's called an oolite. Can you say that with me? Can you say that with me? Oolite. I had to practice it many times. An oolite is a grain of sand that's been in water that is washed back and forth and back and forth, and then minerals that are in the water stick to the outside of it, and they make it just a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. They're still really small though, right? Can you see them, how small they are? They're just tiny. But inside of that, at the very center, there's a little piece of sand that got minerals layer upon layer, like a, like a jawbreaker. 
You guys don't eat jawbreakers, do you? Not very often. Right. Well, do you know that that takes a really long time? And this is the part for the rest of you. Sometimes things take a really long time. And we get impatient. And we want things to happen right now. Is anybody impatient right now? Nobody up here. You guys are all very patient kids, right? (laughs) Super patient. You can wait for a long time for things to happen. But you know what? Sometimes things do take a long time, and we have to be patient. But God is making something really neat. And if we can just be patient and wait for God's time, then something wonderful can result. Can you guys be patient? Am I going to get a commitment from patience for you guys? Am I going to get a commitment from patience for you guys? Eh, you're working on it. <laughs> Mark shaking his head back there. Well, if we can be patient, then God can do wonderful things, all right? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for taking your time with us. We're not always what we need to be, but you are patient with us. And we ask that you would give us patience, that we might be able to move through the days and wait upon you. Bless each one of these kids as they get to places where they feel like they might be getting a little impatient. Give them that patience. Help them to know that you are creating something wonderful. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Can I have it back? It's not mine. I can't give it to you. All right, Ooh, ooh, light. You have to look that one up. Oh. <laughs> I feel like that. I get it. Uh, I didn't have snacks, no cookies for him. Yeah. Uh, so it is Pentecost Sunday. Uh, the church calendar has that comes along once a year, and on Pentecost Sunday, if you don't read the story from Acts 2, then you're, I don't know, you're doing something wrong, probably. So we're going to read this story from Acts chapter 2. This is beginning in the first verse, and then moving through verse 21. Obviously, that's not the whole story, but it's what we're going to look at today. So beginning in the first verse, Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors to Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongue. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. 
I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Back when I was doing finished carpentry, on occasion, we were laying down the baseboard in the rooms that we worked in, and we'd come across a drywall screw that wasn't quite seated all the way into the wall. It's kind of hard, you know, if you're hanging drywall all the way down there by the floor to drive a screw in and, and get it sunk below the surface. But the problem was if there was, that screw wasn't all the way below the surface, it would hold the baseboard out, and there'd be a gap behind it, and it wasn't, uh, it was hard to deal with. And I'm not really proud of this. This is maybe not the right way to deal with the problem, but the solution was to use that tool that every carpenter carries, right? Get the hammer. Get the hammer out and just pound the snot out of that screw and get it to seat down below the surface. Well, you can't seat a screw with a hammer. It, you just end up with a pulpy divot and a broken screw. But it wasn't pretty at least though we could go ahead and run the baseboard. Now you probably heard this adage before, when all you have is a hammer, every problem is a nail. But obviously the world is full of problems that aren't nails. You, you can't seat a drywall screw with a hammer. I've tried this, you, you just bend it over, you just break it off, and, and that's not a really a big problem if you're gonna cover up that mess with some baseboard, but sometimes all you get is a mess. That adage, clearly it's not about hammers and nails. It's about using the right tool for the job and not using that technique or that method or that approach that's not going uh, uh, to realize the appropriate results. That makes sense. But do we get it? We need to start our Pentecost journey today back in the Old Testament. A lot of stuff begins in the Old Testament. Like a lot of things, the journey begins with a problem. The children of Israel, and we need to know at this time, they weren't really like the, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel. It was just people that happened to be descendants of, of this guy, Israel. Uh, the children of Israel were not in good shape. A famine had, had driven them out of the land that their ancestor Abraham had, had settled in, and had run them south to Egypt. Now down in Egypt, Joseph, their blood, had been there and he'd saved up some, some resources for them, was able to help them. And so initially it's good. Things are working out pretty well for him. But things, as you know from the story, don't stay good. Uh, the Egyptians, they get scared of their power, their strength, the, the numbers, and they, so they enslave them. They oppress these people. They were beaten. They were abused. They were kicked around, forced to make the mud bricks and and work under this tyrannical boot of the Egyptian overlords. And so finally, God has enough. These are God's people, and God's had enough of this of oppression, and he sends Moses, you know the story, he sends Moses to lead them out of this bondage and back to this land that was supposed to be theirs. And you know about the plagues, right? All this terrible stuff that happens to Egypt, the the frogs and the lice and the blood water and all that kind of thing. And, and you know about Pharaoh's hard heart, how every time it seemed like he was going to let him go, he turned, changes his mind. And you know all this. And, but eventually the story goes that, that God has had enough. God says, this is it. And he sends one final plague, the one that will really break the children of Israel free. And he says through Moses that the people have to be ready for this. This is the angel of death. It's coming to take the firstborn. And the people have to be ready to go, ready to take off. And all of this becomes, for the children of Israel, for the people of Israel, for Jews, it becomes the tradition of Passover, where that angel of death passes over them with the unleavened bread and the, the roasted lamb, the bitter herbs that were meant to remind them of their captivity. Now, according to the story, they head out into the desert and they eventually make their way all the way to Sinai, where again, according to tradition, it, 
it took them 50 days to get there. And there at Sinai, what do they get? The law. The commandments. Given by God to Moses and passed down to them. That's a pretty big deal that happens there at Sinai. Is this is where they become more than just the kids of this one guy, of Jacob, of Israel. This is where they become the people of Israel, the children of Israel in a sense of being whole and a people. Now the Jewish people, they still commemorate this event. Passover, obviously, that's a big deal. That comes around every year. But, every, but 50 days after the second day of Passover, they celebrate Shavuot, the, the, the Feast of Weeks. They remember the seven weeks of travel between the release of captivity and the giving of the law, the law coming on that 50th day after they left Egypt. Shavuot is, is better known by, to us by its Greek name. It means the 50th, Pentecost. The church calendar it follow, follows some of these Jewish traditions. Easter, that's around Passover. And then seven weeks later, 49 days, and then the 50th day, we have our own observance of the 50th, Pentecost Sunday, today. Now for us, Pentecost is what we read. It's all about this story in Acts 2 with the coming of the Holy Spirit, the sound of that rushing wind and the divided tongues like fire that come to rest over each of the gathered believers. So much so that we've perhaps lost sight of where it comes from, lost sight of its historical context. You see, Luke didn't just make this name up. He didn't just say, uh, let's call it Pentecost. No, that was already part of the cultural landscape. It had its own meaning before the Holy Spirit got a hold of it and imparted it with this new significance. And it's probable that Luke, being led by the same Spirit, was, wasn't just referencing the Shavuot festival as a, as a place marker. A, 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 well, we just got to call it a certain day, so today's the day. There's a significance to this, an importance to this, to the, the Holy Spirit coming on this day, on the very day that God had come to his people all those years before and gave them the tools that they needed to respond appropriately to the problems that they would face. So how well did they do? I don't know, if you read the Bible, you kind of know the answer to this, right? Not great. Sometimes okay, but by and large, God gives them this whole box of appropriate tools in the form of the law, and they don't know what to do with them. Did they stop using their human reasoning, their human intuition and understanding to navigate the challenges that they were faced with? Or did they just keep on using that hammer, <laughs> treating every problem as if it were a nail? Well, we know about this. It's in the prophets. You read the words of the prophets. In particular, I want to call attention to the prophet Joel. If you want to turn to that book in your Bible, you can, well, if you want to get scared and lose sleep tonight, you can turn to that book. There's some pretty hairy stuff in there. But in the first chapter of, the, of Joel, the prophet laments this calamity that has come on the people. A terrible thing has happened to them. Hear this, O elders, he says. Give ear, all inhabitants of the land, has such a thing happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. When the cutting locusts left, the swarming locusts have eaten. What the swarming locusts have left, the hopping locusts have eaten. And what the hopping locusts have left, the destroying locust has eaten. Is there anything left? Locusts blown in on the southern wind had, had destroyed the crops, just denuded the land completely. But this pales in comparison to what's coming next, according to the prophet. In the second chapter of Joel, Joel says that there will be a plague that makes the locusts look tame, coming in from the north this time. 
Blow the trumpet in Zion, he writes. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all of the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will be again after them in ages to come. Fire devours in front of them, and behind them a flame burns. Before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, but after them a desolate wilderness. And nothing escapes them. And most terrible... Most unsettling to me, Joel tells the people in verse 11 of that second chapter that it will be the Lord who leads this destroying army. But there might be a way out. There might be an escape. There might be a way to to get out of this destruction far greater than any plague of locusts could ever be if the people would return to God. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your clothing. Return to the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And relents from punishing. So this is a situation that it looks like the children of Israel are facing. The one that Joel is trying to address. The the people had not been faithful to God. They had not used those tools that they had been given in the law with care. And they had simply fallen into the same old patterns of oppression and abuse that they were familiar with all the way back in Egypt. Only now they were oppressing each other instead of being the ones oppressed. All they thought they had was a hammer. The hammer of violence. The hammer of force. Of pride and greed. And every problem that they saw looked like a nail. And Joel used the illustration of locusts. This plague of locusts that they had just endured to shine a light on what was coming the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now most scholars agree that Joel is a pre-exilic book, uh, that it was written before the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom had been destroyed by foreign armies and taken into captivity. Well, it looks like they didn't hear Joel. They didn't listen to his message of repentance. Which brings us to Pentecost again. Luke's account in chapter 2, it's a, it's a really good story. It's a really good narrative. It's exciting. It's a wonderful word here in and of itself. They were all together in that room, all together in one place. They'd been praying together, waiting for whatever this thing was that Jesus had promised them and told them to wait for in the previous chapter. And suddenly in the room there's this noise like a great and rushing wind. It's, it's in and around them. And then the fire It comes and it divides, and each person, just imagine that right now, look around. Imagine it. Tongue of fire over every head in this place. And each of them begins to manifest the power of the Spirit. People from all over the known world, from every corner, they can begin to hear these rustic Galileans who shouldn't know anything wouldn't know what to do with with what they were given. They begin to hear them speaking in their native languages. And in response to the accusation that they'd all been drinking and, and everything, Peter preaches this marvelous sermon. It's wonderful. And the Spirit adds to their number 3,000 converts. Now that last part's not part of the text that we read today. We stopped at the end of that quotation from the prophet Joel, which we can't avoid. It's a wonderful story in Acts 2. There's a little bit of darkness to it. You see, Luke's story of Pentecost is so powerful 
It's such a wonderful story. It's so formational for the church. We sometimes treat that story as a completely Christian story, as if it somehow sprung fully formed right there from the pages of Acts. We've even got a whole Christian tradition that's named after this one event, Pentecostal, in honor of that, that time and, and this day and this story. It's so much a part of the Christian story that we might gloss over all that history, all that context, all the stuff that Luke is talking about. Luke doesn't gloss over it, though, and we shouldn't either. There's a reason that this event happens on this day. On the day of the festival of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, And there's a reason that the Spirit enables Peter to quote this particular passage from the prophet Joel, and I suspect that it has to do with using the right tool for the job. Having this formational event, this profound formational event for the church happen on the very day that commemorated the giving of the law, that should make us think. That should make us think. I don't want to put too much emphasis on the law and try to get us to return to some kind of of legalistic rule keeping. That really wasn't what the law was about to begin with. But we have to remember that the gift of grace that's offered through the blood of Jesus Christ, it, it only reframes the perfect law of God. It doesn't make it meaningless. Jesus told us himself he did not come to do away with the law but to fulfill it. You see, the law is what it is. This, this set of tools meant for us to help us do our work well. Just because we're always using the wrong tool for the job, it doesn't mean that the tools themselves are imperfect. You've probably heard this adage too, a poor workman blames his tools. And the greatest part of the law, the central part of the law, is still in effect. Love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. And so what God gave to the children of Israel all of those years ago, the thing that is celebrated on this day, Pentecost Day for the children of Israel, it still has significance on the day that the Spirit is poured out on this infant church. And just like it's still significant today, Luke simply notes that God is always giving us what we need to do our work well. Now the second piece, that was the first piece, the second piece of of this historical context that's important to us is this quote from Joel. That's a great quote, isn't it? It's a marvelous quote. Peter really picks a winner here when he says these words. It's full of inspiration. It's full of hope. It's profoundly encouraging for people that have felt marginalized and couldn't do anything. It's like, now I can. I can dream dreams. I can see visions. And it doesn't matter where I come from. It doesn't matter if I'm a son or a daughter. It doesn't matter if I'm a slave or a free person. I can do this. Young and old, everybody. It equips the church. Everybody gets the Spirit, and and wonderful things start happening because of it. Dreams are dreamt. Prophecies are prophesied. Visions are envisioned. But to, to hear that part of the prophecy, the part that points to the pouring out of the Spirit of God without hearing the whole rest of that text, that would be to miss the central point. Now, Peter doesn't miss it, and we shouldn't miss it either, You see it right there in Peter's quote in verses 19 and 20 and 21 of Acts 2. Peter talks about these portents and signs about fire and blood and smoke. He talks about a darkened sun and a bloody moon. The pouring out of the Spirit, that's only one sign of this great and glorious day of the Lord. Calamity, destruction, that's right there too. This is what Joel was talking about. These first two chapters of Joel, it it, it deals with this. It's what Peter is talking about. It's what we need to hear today. You see, Pentecost, it's not just about equipping the church. It's not just about giving you stuff so that you can prophesy or see visions or dream dreams. Having the Spirit come on the day of Pentecost, it is something of a mentorship. 
It's God saying, hey, I, I gave you the tools that you need. It's clear, though, you don't know which end of the hammer to hold. So I'm going to come in. I'm going to make sure that you can do what you need to do. I'll come to you. I will pour my spirit upon you. And so you will be able to do what you need to do. You see, God's not making the tools unnecessary. He's not setting the law aside. He's just helping us use the law appropriately. And there's a very good reason that we need to use the law appropriately, to use the right tool for the job. It's what Joel is talking about, that great and glorious and terrible day of the Lord. You see, ultimately, Peter's quotation from Joel, that his whole sermon, this whole of this whole wonderful Acts 2 story of Pentecost, all of it is about repentance. Repentance. Just like it was at Sinai. Just like it was in Joel's own day. It's about calling on the name of the Lord. It's about looking at the mess, looking at the destruction, looking at what's coming and saying, I, I need you, Lord. I can't, get through, I can't get through this by myself. I need you. Luke's record of Pentecost and Acts is exactly the same message recorded in Joel's prophecy. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all of your heart. Return to the Lord your God, for he is what? Gracious and merciful, slow to anger. Oh, patient, patient, patient. Abounding in steadfast love, willing to relent from punishment. You see, Pentecost, for the church at least, it's a reminder that we are equipped for a purpose. There's a reason that God has equipped us the way that he has. There's a reason that God has poured out his spirit on us. It's not so that we can celebrate how cool we are. Look what I can do. I'm awesome. I'm not really awesome. It's not so that we can celebrate our capacity, our own ability to dream dreams or see visions. It's not so that we can to say, hey, look, I can speak in tongues. The whole purpose of Pentecost is so that we can proclaim this great and glorious day of the Lord and be able to help people call on the name of the Lord and be saved. It's about repentance. Now the part of Joel that Peter quotes, that's the good part. That is the good part. The rest of Joel is pretty scary. But Peter knew that, that his quote was going to bring to mind all the rest of it. The, the stuff, the, the darkness and the, the, the destruction. And if there was any question that the rest belongs in our minds... He's included a little of that himself, that dark, scary part, verses 19 and 20. The day of the Lord, it probably will bring some fear and trembling to people. It might even bring a little fear and trembling to us. Because according to Joel, the, the Lord does not stand for disobedience. Will not put up with it forever. God gave us the tools that we need to work well. And if we reject those tools, if we ignore those tools, if we don't use them properly and we continually use the wrong tools to try to get what we want, then judgment is inevitable. I think we can agree that there's a lot of wrong tool use going on these days. How do you make your point? How do you, how do you get your opinion expressed these days is it the right tool for the job the way it's happening there's a lot more violence than peace these days a lot more division than reconciliation and make no mistake we can't keep using that same wrong tool and expect different results that's the definition of insanity and the day of the Lord is coming but thank God that we are not left to our own devices. Thank God that we have more than just a hammer to deal with the problems that we're faced with. And thank God that God is with us. That we are not orphans. That we are not alone. We couldn't 
save ourselves, let alone call anybody else to repentance without this outpouring of the Spirit of God. So I just want you to remember this. In all the Pentecost celebrations, and all the, yay, God gave us His Spirit, and all the joyous recognition of those wonderful gifts that the Spirit bestows upon us, we have to keep in mind that there's a purpose to those gifts, just like there was a purpose to the law. It helps us with our obedience, and it helps us help others call upon the name of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you've given us your spirit, and that spirit is of enormous comfort in these trying times. Often it is the only thing that comforts, to know that we are yours, and that you are near, that you have not left us alone, that we are not orphans, but we are your dearly loved children. And Lord, that spirit has given us power, power that is beyond our imagination, power far beyond what we use on a regular basis. We can see dreams. There are visions and prophecies to express. And Lord, this Spirit has been poured out on each of us, men and women, young and old, slave and free. Each of us has received a measure of your wondrous presence. And yet, Lord, we fall time and again back to those same patterns, same human ways of reacting to problems. For this we ask your forgiveness. Help us to see the gift that you've given us for what it is. As a tool that we need to help build your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your red hymnal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Turn to number 49. <clears throat> and could we stand, please? This has a little different way of arranging for the chorus. So when we get to the DS down at the bottom of the page, we return back up and then we do the italicized words. It'll make sense. Clear as mud. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs>
have the Spirit, the Spirit of God is upon you to dream dreams, to see visions, to prophesy. You have something to do in the world. Pray with me. Lord, these your people are ready to go, to go into the world, to proclaim your good news to speak of the coming day of the Lord, but it is a day full of glory, full of wonder, full of joy for those that call upon that name. Bless them, keep them safe until we can gather again to praise and worship you. Make our hands strong for the work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go in peace.